On this episode of Georgia Traveler, we journey from the high country to the low country. We've become the national model of, for sustainability. They have to visit two million flowers to make one pound of honey. From the mountains to the coast, see what the buzz is all about on the next Georgia Traveler. We begin this week in the low country on Wilmington Island, home to the Savannah Bee Company. It is the golden liquid that never spoils. Produced from kind-hearted flying insects that often get a bad rap from their more aggressive relatives. The majestic honeybee has been around since before the dinosaurs and their flawless product has been perfected in so many different varieties. Let's journey to Wilmington Island in the Savannah Low Country to learn more about these incredible creatures and discover a man who has built his own hive of honeybee gems known as the Savannah Bee Company. Started when this old gentleman, Roy Hightower, put his beehives on our property. We had about 100 acres and he would take me into the beehives and I was terrified and would put on them, you know rain pants and rain coats and you know literally so I wouldn't get stung at all but I remember one time I pulled a frame out and held it up against the sun and you could see the different color honey shining through it was kind of like stained glass and this one tasted like this and this one tasted different. Tell me about the different colors and how that happens. Right yeah a lot of people think it's the bee but it's the species of flower. Okay. So honeybees come over there drink up that nectar, take it back to the hive, fan it with their wings, dry out the water, and it turns into honey. I walked in here, within a minute, I learned the three types of bees, the drone, right. the worker, and the queen. All okay. worker bees are female, and okay. people don't know that. And um, it's a very matriarchal society. You have a queen, you have all these females, and they basically keep the males around just because out of necessity. Tell me the role of the drone. They are fat and lazy. There's not, and they're the males, there's not very many of them. Their sole job is to mate with the queen. So they all go hang out for like five hours a day on a limb somewhere. If a virgin queen flies by, they all chase her and the fastest ones can mate with the queen. If they do mate with her, they fall down and die and that's their swan song. That part's not very pretty. <laughs> Ted then took me outside to one of his Wilmington Island hives to get some of this Savannah gold straight from the source. And let me tell you, it doesn't get any better than this. It's oh, yeah. soft. Oh, they're gonna yeah. run down. Yeah. They don't mind me destroying. If someone did this in my house, I'd be really ticked off. They're okay. They're gonna just clean it all up. That, uh, is, a, that is incredible. It's warm honey. Yeah. It's not every day. Yeah. It's like this really warm honey. And the palm honey is just traditionally thin honey anyway. Yeah, yeah. I love it. But isn't that neat? Yeah. Let's fill up on honey here. Yeah. Do you see this hive? It's like a mini factory. There's 60,000 bees probably in there. They're coming and going, coming and going. They have to visit two million flowers to make one pound of honey. So on that one frame, when it's all sealed, that's about six pounds of honey. So they visited 12 million flowers to do that. And just when I was starting to feel comfortable and confident around the bees. All right, Ted, what are you doing? <laughs> all right. Oh my gosh. Go. Just be calm, just don't squeeze them between your fingers. Okay, okay, not happening. Not gonna happen. That's, they're fuzzy, they feel fuzzy. And they're tickly. I think it's time to get these bees off of my hand. Good job. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't planning on doing that All right, today. That's good, uh, though, isn't it? Yeah, that was cool. Didn't even need the veil for that. Now, tasting the wide variety of honey and honeybee products at either of the two historic Savannah locations is an experience in itself. Much like a wine bar, honey tasting challenges your palate based on the region, the flower, and the changing seasons. The two blows the honey our company was founded on. You're gonna give it a shot here? Yeah, that pump makes it really easy to just let the honey drop right down to the spoon for you, so you can mm. use the same one. Um, no limit on how much. Okay, I'll have one of those. Okay. <laughs> now, I love to go from the Tupelo to the Sourwood. That one's from northern Georgia, although it's often seen in the Carolinas and the Tennessee as well. 
Mm. So we've gone from low country to high country here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Over to a wildflower honey. Okay. So that's our southwestern Georgia wildflower. It's from the Stockton, Georgia area around the Okefenokee Swamp. Swamp honey. Mm -hmm. This is a first. <laughs> this is a first. It tastes really good, yeah. I have no idea what swampy tastes like. But... It's just, it's warm and earthy. It has that very natural taste to it that you don't get in the little honey bears you get at the grocery store. Yeah, well that, that's, that's what's so different about all these is they, <laughs> they have such a unique flavor. How about eating honeycomb? Oh yeah. Now, this is the most raw nutritional way to eat honey. Cut a nice gooey chunk, don't be shy. Cut oh. top to bottom and get some of that honeycomb. Just 100% like edible, okay. yeah. And then top it off, oh, we have yeah. three local cheeses featured here from Flat Creek Lodge over in Swainsboro, Georgia. Know it well. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I think it's incredible. The people often do what I just did, just make their whole way down the line. And, oh, that's what we, mm. we tell everyone to do that. Try them all. <laughs> and of course, the Savannah Bee Company store would not be complete without an employee who works here named... B. And yes, it really is B. I'm not just messing with you. <laughs> so we have the employee named B, and of course, a B skep, which is incredibly popular with both the kids and me. See ya. So today I learned that much like humans, the female honeybee makes all of the decisions and has the final say. But more importantly, I acquired a new appreciation for the art of beekeeping and the amazing honeybee. Let's now travel to the hills with Phil as he discovers an outdoor museum that offers a glimpse of 1800s mountain living. Hey Traveler family, it's Big Phil Proctor and have I got a travel destination for you located in the North Georgia mountains. It's called the Fox Fire Museum and Heritage Center. It's an outdoor museum and y'all know I enjoy being outdoors, but I never had an idea what it would be like to take a tour of an outdoor museum. It all began in 1966 when a group of high school students wanted to take their English class outside of the classroom. It came about as part of the Fox Fire Magazine class. Students were out interviewing people, preserving their culture and heritage, and, and all along the people were giving them items to store, preserve for future generations. So the students needed a place to, to house those things and display them, and, and they came up with this idea to create this village that we're at. And it's evolved into the museum that, that we're at today. Consisting of approximately 20 plus cabins, the Fox Fire Museum and Heritage Center takes you back in time and offers a unique perspective into Southern Appalachian living in the 1800s. Notice that it's, it's dark because there was no electricity back then and there weren't windows. Right, in the early 1800s around here, you couldn't get glass. So houses were built without windows, so it's very dark in there. People would use candles and of course a fireplace. All right, so what is this cabin that we're walking up on now? This is our wagon shed. The wagon shed. We store two of our wagons in it. The one on the right there is we call it Judd Nelson Wagon, and it was made by Judd Nelson for Foxfire. Okay. He made the entire thing himself. He was a master blacksmith. Many different individuals donated the hand planes that you saw down there, uh, the shaving horses. Some of them were actually made for Foxfire and then donated as, as part of an article. The draw knives and saws and augers were all donated by various people throughout the years. You get a lot of students that come up here. How do you keep their attention? Well, we, we try to get them engaged with some hands-on activities. Uh, we do the laundry. We have tools that they use. Uh, we have toys that they play with in our uh, folk art gallery. So giving them things that they can handle and touch and use gives them more sense of how people used to do things. Now, I'm a hands-on kind of guy, and it was time to get my hands on something. Okay, Barry, you finally got me in here. I see a lot of tools, I see a lot of wood, and I see, what is this? Well, this is our shaving horse, and that's a draw knife sitting there. You use the draw knife on the shaving horse. I'd like to try this and see what it was like back in the 1800s. And try it is what I did. I also took a whack at becoming a blacksmith. Uh. Okay, so I dropped a few. <laughs> this is soft coal, and it helps get our wood going and then our coal going. We're getting ready now. To work the metal, you heat it up so that it's soft. And when it's soft, you shape it. That's the process you're doing all day. Okay, well, you know what? We've had a good time in the blacksmith shop. I still want to go see more. Okay. 
Our next stop on this quarter mile trail was the broom maker and the village weaver. It was exciting to watch these two talented, skillful women perfect their art. Now with all the hard work these folks had going on back then, you had to amuse yourself in some kind of way. I found a pair of stilts and I couldn't leave without trying them on for size. I know the Temptations used to do a dance, but I'm gonna try to do it on these stilts. That's a da 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 Yeah. So if you're traveling north on 985 towards North Georgia, stop by the Fox Fire Museum and Heritage Center for some great history and some old school fun. That's it, Big Phil, I'm out. <laughs> Next, we join Christine in Lakeland to see how one family has resurrected olive farming in Georgia. Ah, uh, how'd you like to wake up to this every day? And this. Lisa Sutton's famous breakfast at the Inn at Still Pond Bed and Breakfast has something more to it than meets the eye, or should I say mouth? Have you ever gone out to eat to a restaurant or like where we are today at this beautiful bed and breakfast and said, how did that get on my plate? Well, here at the Inn at Still Pond, you don't have to go far. In fact, some of it was grown right in the backyard. That's right, farm to table is literally just a few steps here at Still Pond Farms, and it's a certified organic farm too. Why is it important for you to farm organic? Well, we decided several years ago we wanted to know where our food came from, and we wanted it to be free of chemicals. Right, and yeah. you actually grew up here, did you know? I did, uh, my family's farmed on this land for four generations. Farm to table in about 30 seconds. Still Pond Farms grows their own potatoes for Lisa's potato salad, honey and pecans for her homemade granola, and okra, cucumbers, and blackberries for canning. But the most intriguing farm to table food around here, the homegrown olive oil. They grow olives in Georgia? Oh yes, lots and lots of olives. You'll notice an olive theme around the inn, from the olive oil to the olive soaps in your room, they just love olives around here. Barian and Lisa grow some of the olives right here on their property, but they're also part owners of Georgia Olive Farms in nearby Lakeland. All right, when you think of olive oil, you think of Italy, Greece, the Mediterranean region, maybe not so much Georgia. Well, we just decided to take a leap of faith. But before Georgia Olive Farm came to be, these little guys had to take a long journey to get here. It is believed olives were first used 5,000 years ago in the Mediterranean. Ancient Greeks and Romans revered olive oil as the nectar of the gods. Later, Romans brought olive trees to Spain, and Spanish explorers then brought the olives to the New World in the 16th century, including St. Simons and Cumberland Island. And today, the South Georgia region is second only to California in total olive orchard acreage. Who knew? Do you ever think someday you'd be, you know, saying, oh, I grow olive trees now? <laughs> well, believe it or not, I was fortunate um, in college, I, I was able to do a study abroad and I took my last two classes from Georgia in Verona, Italy. Because I knew when I came home what good olive oil was supposed to taste like. It didn't have that fresh flavor that tasted like olive oil was supposed to taste like. So, Jason Shaw and his partners started Georgia Olive Farms in 2009. Their liquid gold comes from three varieties, Arbequina, Arbasana and Cornique. Olive oil is never better than the minute that it's pressed. And the minute you bottle it and, and get it on the shelves, I mean, the clock is ticking. And I think that's the biggest problem with a lot of the olive oil we have available. It's past its prime. While olive oil has been a mainstay of the Mediterranean diet for centuries, the American olive oil craze is still fairly new, especially in the traditional Southern diet. So we've come a long way. Now you'll see that bottle of Georgia olive oil on my mom's kitchen, and she does use it quite a bit, but she still uses a little butter in her pound cakes. Hey, nothing wrong with that. So how does this magical little fruit, completely undigestible straight off the tree, get magically transformed into this liquid gold for your table? The olive is about as high maintenance as you can get. Here's how it works. This massive harvester gets the olives off the trees, then the fruit is processed and pressed right here at the farm. When we pick that fruit, it's gonna go straight to that mill and preferably be processed within six to eight hours. And producing a high quality oil is very important. 98% of the olive oil consumed in the U.S. is still imported from overseas. 1% comes from California and the other 1% from all other states, including Georgia. But that Georgia-grown liquid gold is catching up. Things are definitely looking up uh, more so than ever. You know, we, like I said, we're hitting full production age-wise and we're loaded with fruit. 
And this tiny little fruit is responsible for so much of the cooking around the world, going back to ancient times, from Roman emperors to Greek philosophers, to even traditional southern dishes, now made with Georgia-grown olive oil. And this history lesson couldn't be tastier. So the next time you have olive oil, know that you are taking part in a delicious tradition that dates back to ancient times. In fact, Hippocrates himself said that good old olive oil cures a variety of ailments. So the next time you're having a toast, toast please. Instead of wine, use olive oil to toast your good health. Hmm. delicious. There's fun to be had in the hills of Georgia. Enter Lake Winnipesoka and prepare for good old classic amusement. Welcome to Lake Winnipesoka, where we'll show you a good time and wear a bathing suit, because they'll soak ya. For over 85 years, there's been a family in Northwest Georgia delivering fun times in a big way to people of all ages. Lake Winnipesoka, the Cherokee word for beautiful water, is known more simply these days as Lake Winnie. This thrill in the hills is a true throwback amusement park in the spirit of Coney Island. Founded by her grandparents in 1925, Miss Adrian and the family still, amazingly, run the show. Even as the rides get bigger, the thrills get better, and the visitors get wetter. My grandfather was very much an outdoors person. And he bought this property in 1924 from a fishing club. He wanted to start the Coney Island of, of the South and uh, opened it in 1925. So you all survived it, during the Depression? Oh, absolutely, yes, we did. Adrian's daughter, Tally, somehow keeps this massive park in check. She embraces the nostalgia carried by this classic American treasure of a park, welcoming families with open arms and a healthy dose of good old Southern hospitality. We're the third longest operating amusement park in the United States. It's just a wonderful family operation run by families for families. So no better place to start my Lake Winnie adventure than on America's first boat shoot, the inspiration for the log ride. It was built in 1927 and still operating. We love the boat shoot. We love the boat shoot. And it's dark. And the Amusement Park Historical Association says it's the only ride of its kind left, and so we're proud of it. Oh, yeah. What do you say we do that about 10 more times? Are you going to be on the other ride? Yep. That, 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 maybe that. You're doing every ride here? Oh, yeah. Another Lake Winnie classic is the cannonball. And don't be deceived by the old school engineering. This baby catches air in at least three spots. And remember, you must be at least 48 inches tall to ride the cannonball. Now, Sean, this is your first day doing it. You are 48 inches tall. Congratulations. <laughs> he is going to ride the cannonball for the first time. Hold on, Sean. Lake Winnie, of course, offers other old school fun land classics that never go out of style, like the Ferris wheel, the Alpine Way sky lift, and the High Striker Strongman game, where you can right. step right up and test your strength. No one has ever gotten it to the top. <laughs> yes! Yes! Uh, that's the highest you've ever seen, right? There are plenty of great rides for the youngsters, which adults can enjoy as well. And if your stomach's up for it, the spinning rides. Do the fireball, then eat lunch. Got it. Yeah, Mike and I didn't do too well. Boston did okay. Young guys, man, they can they can do all this crazy stuff. Yeah, I, what happened to us? Us dads, we gotta figure out how to keep up, man. I don't know. 
Tennyson Dickinson grew up right behind Lake Winnie. In fact, her old backyard has now become the Sokia Water Park. All our customers were coming to us and saying, you need a water park. Why don't you have a water park? Have you ever thought of a water park? And we would just smile because we had it on the drawing board all along. Water slides, tube slides, kiddie pools and waterfalls, all surrounded by a 900-foot crazy river, make Sokia the cherry on top to the ever-growing funland perfection that is Lake Winnipesoka. Let's now join Ashley and Kennesaw to explore the farm-to-table to farm experience for students and visitors alike. Attention foodies! What if I told you there's a five-star lunch with a $10 price tag awaiting your palate? To what lengths would you go to find it? Did I mention all you can eat? Kennesaw State University's The Commons takes year-round collegiate dining to an unprecedented level. This sustainable commissary pioneers a farm-table farm approach to food service, starting with, well, farm. It takes three to feed this machine. On one farm, we bring in honey. The other two farms, just your normal corn, tomatoes, squash, zucchini. We'll be planting broccoli, cauliflower, lettuces. We have a mushroom yard uh, back in the go. woods that we're growing shiitake mushrooms. We just try to grow everything. You can't have nutritive veggies without seasoned veggie patrol, of course. Meet Tater, farm staff and renowned vermin catcher. The role of the dogs are to keep the fields clear of rodents and snakes, um, birds and crows and uh, just morale, really. But canines aren't the only creatures earning their keep. Through a process called vermicomposting, these slimy laborers consume food refuse and produce castings that help remineralize the soil. We've lost about 30% of our nutrients for our vegetables. So what our grandfathers ate had more nutrient content in it than, it, than we do now. So by adding some of the base elements back to the soil, we hope to bring that nutrient level back up in our vegetables. This homegrown produce travels less than five miles to my favorite location in the farm table farm back loop, the, oh, the table. The commons on the bob. The commons on the bob. A meal at Kennesaw State University's The Commons is the most uncommon experience you'll ever have dining on a college campus. You can go in freely and gladly, but you may never come out. Entrapment of the tastiest variety. Nine food stations featuring KSU and locally grown ingredients vie for your attention. Daily features and their origins are displayed on the Locavore board. We smoke our own meats, we grind our own corned beef, we make 90% of everything from scratch. We've become the national model of, for sustainability and for food quality and service. There's really not a university in the system that I know of that does what we do. Just walk around with a plate and see one of the coolest common features unfold. Hydroponic crops and herbs growing right no, before your like eyes. Of, uh, Even picky bottle. eaters have it's options. This is normally where the hydroponic lettuce goes, and I don't eat lettuce. So I'm not sad to see that there's basil growing here. This is the second stage of our hydroponics. This is the propagation tent, where about three weeks ago, these started out from seed. It's a cleaner way of growing it. There's uh, absolutely no chance of pests, what? disease, so that's why tater doesn't work here in the dining room. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> These sustainable practices take root in everyone because the proof is in the pudding. Our busiest station four years ago was the hamburger hot dog station and cheesesteaks. And now it's our salad bar and our proteins. So now they ask for things like goat, octopus. Um, so it's completely changed the way our students are eating. What year are you at KSU, Chris? I'm a fifth year senior, taking well, the long route. The long route? <laughs> uh, is it because of the dining hall? Let's just get partially, real. Partially, partially. Tell me what's on your plate right now, Chris. Um, starting out with a salad, just I'm um, exercise science, so I like to be healthy. There are two farm fates for scraps left behind on guest trays, composting, or the biodigester, where food becomes unrecognizable. We'll take plate waste from student meals and uh, dump it in here and it recycles into a nutrient-rich water for our irrigation systems. It acts like a human stomach. Well, let's take a look at those guts, Bobby. Come on, yeah, open it it's up. Not, it's not very aesthetically Whoa. pleasing, but there you go. Wow. Science is amazing. Waste not, want not. This farm table farm effort seems pretty perfect until you meet the one drawback of the entire enterprise. Indecision. I saw them making the pizza dough today, so I think I'm going to have some pizza for lunch. 
Then they also had this really good sandwich at the delis. Named Innovator of the Year by the National Restaurant Association, ahead of contenders like Walt Disney Parks and the U.S. Air Force, KSU's The Commons is truly one in a meal, yo. Now I'm gonna do pizza. If there's any place on the Georgia map where it's perfectly safe you to know? drink the proverbial yeah. Kool-Aid, I'd say it's The Commons. It's delicious. And we'll continue our search for the world's best plate. That does it for this high country to low country episode of Georgia Traveler. Until next time, pleasant journeys. Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.